Good morning. I'm going to start with the scripture reading. If you have your Bibles with you, I invite you to turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And the passage that we want to look at this morning is going to be from verse 17 down to verse 34. Just while you're turning there, let me just give you a little bit of background. The context, of course, is, is uh, Paul addressing some issues taking place in the church in Corinth. Corinth was a Greek city, uh, Greek culture. A uh, church had been established there, and this church uh, was facing a number of challenges. You read through 1 Corinthians, you can see that there were some issues. One of the issues was to do with the communion service. And so Paul is addressing that in this passage we're going to look at, and it's going to be just the focus of our reflection this morning. Uh, things, things that were taking place were not necessarily good things. And you almost get the impression that if nothing had gone wrong, Paul wouldn't even have mentioned the communion service. He doesn't seem to make an issue out of it anywhere else. Because things were going wrong, he did deal with it. And what he has to say is instructive to us as we approach the Lord's table for communion this morning. So I'm just going to read, starting in verse 17. This is 1 Corinthians 11. I'm going to read verse 17 through to 34. And I'm reading from... The, the New King James Version. Paul writes, Now in giving these instructions, I do not praise you, since you come together not for the better but for the worse. For first of all, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you, and in part I believe it. For there must also be factions among you that those who are approved may be recognized among you. Therefore, when you come together in one place, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper. For in eating, each one takes his own supper ahead of others. And one is hungry and another is drunk. What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and shame those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I do not praise you. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason, many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened by the Lord, that we may not be condemned with the world. Therefore, my brethren, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. But if anyone is hungry, let him eat at home, lest you come together for judgment. Let's just bow our heads and we'll ask the Lord to guide us as we take some time to reflect on the passage that we've just read. Let's, let's pray. Father in heaven, as we've come this morning to celebrate the Lord's Supper. We pray that you would turn our thoughts to the significance of this memorial. We pray that you would be here through your spirit, that you would come and be amongst us, that you would soften our hearts, that you would make us attentive to your word, that you would fit us to commune with you at your table. And so to that end, we pray for your guidance now. Speak to us through these words. Bring hope, bring courage, bring conviction, we pray, where we need it. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You would probably 
note from that that they conducted their communion service a little differently to the way that we do. Having said that, it probably wasn't completely different. It was more likely the case that they had their, their formal communion, breaking of the bread, drinking from the cup, in conjunction with one, what they would call a love feast. We would probably see it as a potluck lunch. All right, so instead of coming together in church and having the bread and the wine as we do, it would have been at the end of their their potluck meal that was shared together. And with that in mind, it makes a little more sense of what Paul is saying in this passage. I want to just recap. Last time I was here, I, I shared a message about unity and humility. And I just want to recap on that. And the reason I want to do that is because the passage we're looking at ties in uh, very closely with what we talked about last time. Now, the message I shared last time was think soberly, achieve unity. And I made the point that unity comes through humility. And that was the key point in Philippians chapter 2. When Paul talks about having the mind of Christ, he's talking about having the attitude of Jesus in the context of getting along with each other. If we, if we want to be of one mind, working together, striving together in one spirit, we need to have the mind of Christ. We need to have the attitude of Jesus. And that attitude was primarily characterized by humility. So Paul's thought in Philippians 2 was unity comes through humility. Unity comes through having the character of Christ, the humility of Christ. Now, we focused our thoughts last time on Romans 12, verse 3, and we noticed that humility comes through, number one, recognizing my own limitations. We talked about the blind men going to see the elephant. You'll remember that, I think. Six blind men went to see the elephant. All of them grabbed a different part of the elephant and all concluded that the elephant was quite different to the other person's conclusions. Humility comes through recognizing that I don't see the whole elephant. I don't see the whole picture. Number two, I need some input from other people to help me see the big picture. I need to value the contribution of others. And then thirdly, I also need to be willing to make a positive contribution where I can. It's a false humility to say, well, I have nothing to offer. I, I'm really a nobody, therefore I'm not going to do anything. That's, that's not true humility. That's a false humility. So humility comes, so unity comes through humility. Humility comes through recognizing my own limitations, valuing the contribution of others, making a positive contribution where I can. I want to remind you of that because as we come to this passage, as we come to the Lord's Supper, we are essentially celebrating Jesus' humility and his self-sacrifice. Jesus' humility and his self-sacrifice. And the issue at Corinth was that they were coming to celebrate the memorial of humility and self-sacrifice with pride and selfishness. Okay? You can see the problem, can't you? You're coming to celebrate Christ's humility and his self-sacrifice and you're coming with an attitude of pride and selfishness. All right? There's a problem. That's what we want to look at. So we're going to look at three things. As we just unpack this, we're going to be brief. This is a communion service. We're going to try and keep it short. Famous last words. But we're going to start off looking at the perversion of the Lord's Supper. What was going wrong in Corinth? To the purpose of the Lord's Supper, how does Paul try to correct their thinking, get them back on course? And then thirdly, how should we prepare for the Lord's Supper? Those are our, those are our three points, and they're all in this passage. So I want to look at the first one, perversion of the Lord's Supper. What is going wrong in Corinth? Paul's, Paul's words would be quite discouraging, wouldn't they? If, you, if we got a letter addressed to the church in Rockhampton, from someone as esteemed as the Apostle Paul, and he started by saying, we're jumping in, I guess, in chapter 11, but in giving these instructions, I do not praise you since you come together not for the better but for the worse. We wouldn't be encouraged, would we? What, he, what he's saying there is that when you get together as a church, by the time you leave, you're worse off than when you arrived. 
That's pretty sad, isn't it? You know, you'd like to think that coming to church would be a blessing. You'd be encouraged. You'd be edified. Somehow your spiritual walk would be strengthened. Paul says, you know, you guys, you come to church. By the time you leave, your spiritual state has declined, taken a step downward. That's how crazy their church situation was. Now, just be mindful, too, at this point, that in Corinth, first century, they would have been meeting in homes. So their, their church service would have been conducted in someone's home. Now, in, in Corinthian society, in Greek society, there, were, there, were, there was social strata. There were, there were levels of, of, you know, the rich and the poor, the, the achieved and the underachieved. There was quite significant class distinctions. Theoretically, in church, none of that should have been relevant, but the reality was it carried across. Because the rich would have had larger homes than the poor, most of the church events would have been held in the homes of the rich. And the communion service was probably one of those. As I said, it would have been something like what, what we would experience at a potluck. Everyone would have brought food. Of course, the rich would have brought more food and of a better standard. The poor would have brought very little, some perhaps even nothing. And Paul kind of hints at that in... Uh, in one of the verses there, verse 22, when you shame those who have nothing, if we take that literally, there were some people there who were really poorly off. So what's taking place? Two things. Number one, he says in verse 18, there are divisions among you. It's a problem in the church in Corinth because they are not united. They are divided. There are divisions among you. And uh, we touched on some of this last time. We looked already at 1 Corinthians 1. Um, I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. That was Paul's plea. He said it to the church in Philippi. He wrote it here to the church in Corinth. He's reflecting here the heart of God for his people, that they be one, united in mind and in spirit. It's been declared to me concerning you, my brethren, by those of Chloe's household, that there are contentions among you. Now I say this, that each of you says, I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos, I'm of Cephas, or I'm of Christ. Picks that thought up again in chapter 3, and he says, I, brethren, could not speak to you as spiritual people, but as to carnal. As to babes in Christ, I fed you with milk and not with solid food, for until now you were not able to receive it. And even now you are still not able, for you are still carnal. For where there are envy, strife, and divisions among you, are you not carnal and behaving like mere men? For when one says, I'm of Paul, another, I'm of Apollos, are you not carnal? Church full of fleshly people. People who had accepted Christ, who were perhaps even born again, but were living according to the flesh. Divided on, on probably on theology. Some followed this teacher, some followed that teacher. Divided, I'm sure, by social status. Paul says it's not good. It's not good, it's a problem. And he says there that when you come together, this is verse 20, when you come together in one place, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper. All right? You think when you come together, that's what you're coming here for. Now, you've arrived here for church this morning, you think you've come to participate in the Lord's Supper. Paul's kind of saying there, if your attitude's not right, doesn't matter what activity you engage in, it's not the Lord's Supper. That's a funny thought, isn't it? You know, I can remember when I, when I was growing up, I learned to play the bagpipes. just had this, this dream about playing the bagpipes, and so I took lessons and learnt. And I played for a number of years. When I was uh, in, my, in my 20s, I kind of didn't, didn't do much with it. I was busy doing other things. But um, some years back, just before I left New Zealand, I ended up living just down the road from one of the best pipers in the world. And... Uh, got to know him and he offered me some lessons and I thought, boy, what an opportunity to, to pass up. So I used to go down there and, and, and get some lessons from him. And one of the, one of the movements, um, it's, it's, a, it's a little embellishment on, on, the, on the note of D, it's called a D throw. And I'd learned to play it when I was young and I'd played it throughout my years. And anyway, he said to me one day, he said, just play for me a D throw. And I played it and he says, there's two ways to play a D throw. And you're not playing either of them. He said, I don't know what you're doing, but it's not a D throw. 
I was mortified. I had done that for years. I'd played in pipe bands at a uh, fairly high level, gone to national competitions in, in New Zealand as I was growing up. And uh, here was I being told that what I thought I was doing, I wasn't actually doing. I was doing something else, but it wasn't correct. And so Paul says to the church, he says, when you come together, you might think you're coming to participate and celebrate the Lord's Supper. But you're actually doing something else. Paul didn't say what, it, what they were actually doing. Probably didn't know. But it's not the Lord's Supper because their attitude was wrong. There were divisions among them. Secondly, verse 21, he says, In eating, each one takes his own supper ahead of others, and one is hungry, another is drunk. Not only were there divisions based on perhaps theology and, 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 and uh, social status, but they had a selfish disregard for each other. Presumably, the, uh, the host would have been one of the wealthier people in the church, probably prepared, prepared some food as, as a good host would. Others arrived. For some reason, perhaps those who were, who were poor may have been arriving late. And by the time they arrived with their, with their meagre contribution, the best food had already been eaten. A lack of consideration, a lack of consideration for those who weren't as well off, for those who perhaps weren't as punctual. Um, bottom line is there was a selfish disregard. A selfish disregard. And Paul says, with that kind of attitude, I have no praise for you. I cannot commend what you're doing. I cannot even say that what you're doing is the Lord's Supper. And so he, well, just, I put this in there and I forgot I put it in there. <laughs> just, just to compare with what we're doing in Sabbath school, you know, Sabbath school, we're studying Jeremiah. And, and there's this great statement in Jeremiah 7, verses 9 and 10, that kind of reflects a little bit what's going on in the church in Corinth. And Jeremiah, or God, God says to the people through Jeremiah, Will you steal, murder, and commit adultery, and swear falsely, and offer sacrifices to Baal, and walk after other gods that you have not known? Then come and stand before me in this house, which is called by my name, and say, We are delivered, that you may do all these abominations. What's he saying there? He's saying, look, you can't, you can't live like the devil during the week and then come to church and pretend to worship God like you love him and like he's the one you're serving. You can't do that. You can't do that. It just doesn't make sense. You're not saved, you're not delivered to commit all these abominations. And Paul is essentially saying the same thing to the church in Corinth. You cannot... Treat each other with a selfish disregard. You cannot be filled with pride and then come to church on Sabbath and, and, and come to the Lord's table and celebrate this ordinance of humility and self-sacrifice. It just doesn't compute. It's not consistent. It's not consistent. God says to his people in Isaiah, he says, when you spread out your hands in prayer, I will hide my eyes from you. Yes, even though you multiply prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are covered with blood and some 500 or more years later after Isaiah wrote those words the church in Corinth has fallen into the same trap how is it with us that's the question isn't it how is it with us as we come to the Lord's table what's going on in our hearts are there divisions amongst us? Do we experience the unity that God would have us experience? Do we have a selfish disregard for one another? They're important questions, aren't they? Paul reminds them of what the Lord's Supper is all about. He explains to them the, the, the uh, event that took place. Jesus took the bread. Take ye, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. He reminds them that the Lord's Supper was supposed to be a time of reflection, a time to remember the humility and sacrifice of Christ. And he says to them, verse 26, As often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death 
until he comes. The purpose of the Lord's Supper is to proclaim the Lord's death. To remind ourselves of the sacrifice that Jesus was willing to make on our behalf. Do this in remembrance of me. And we've talked about already um, Philippians 2. We covered this last time. Paul's desire that they would be united. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, he says. Essentially saying the same thing to the church in Corinth. In humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. And he points them to Jesus. Have this attitude, have this mind in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, being made in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Jesus, Paul says, was not one to grasp what was his by right. He wasn't one to say, I, I deserve this. I deserve to be treated like that. But it says there he emptied himself of his divine privileges, of his rights. And it says he humbled himself. He became a servant, the lowest of the low, and ultimately experienced death, even the death of the cross. That is the picture of humility and self-sacrifice that Paul wanted the Philippian church to grasp so they could experience the unity that they lacked. And while it's not spelled out in that detail here in 1 Corinthians 11, it's the same idea. Paul wants to remind them that, that in light of their selfishness and their pride, Jesus was humble. Jesus was willing to be less, to be treated worse, to suffer death on the cross. Desire of Ages, page 661, pride and self-worship cannot flourish in the soul. It keeps fresh in memory the scenes of Calvary. That's the solution, isn't it? That's the solution. If we find ourselves full of pride, if we find ourselves looking across the pew at someone else in the church saying, boy, they've got some issues. Glad I'm not like that person. We need to look at the cross, don't we? Pride and self-worship cannot flourish in the soul that keeps fresh in memory the scenes of Calvary. And the purpose of the, of the communion service, or one of the purposes at least, is to remind us of those scenes, to remind us of, of the price that Jesus was willing to pay, the lengths that he was willing to go to, to save you and I. The purpose of the communion service is to keep fresh in our memory the scenes of Calvary. So that pride and self-worship, pride and selfishness might not be allowed to take root and flourish in our hearts. In light of that, the third point we want to look at, the third point that Paul makes here in this passage, is that the abuse of the Lord's Supper is a serious issue and there is an appropriate preparation that we should make. Verse 27, therefore whoever eats this bread and drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. And I remember when I first came back into the church in my 20s, I remember reading this thinking, you know, what does that mean? Who is worthy? How can I, how can I know? I don't, I don't want to experience the judgment of God that's described here. Many are weak and sick and some have died because they've come to the Lord's table with in an unworthy way. Let a man examine himself. I think the context is probably helpful here. 
as we consider who is worthy. Oops, my click is not working for some reason. Oops, there we go. Let a man examine himself, verse 28. What are the questions we want to ask as, as we examine ourselves, as we consider our, our worthiness? Is it, is it, you know, have I, have I sinned? Have I fallen short? Does that disqualify me? Well, that, that can't be because the whole purpose of this is to bring to our remembrance the sacrifice made on our behalf. If we've sinned and we know that and we, and we feel bad about that, then we should come. We need to come. The question we want to ask is, does my attitude reflect the sacrifice being commemorated? That's the key question, isn't it? As I, as I come to the communion table, and as I, as I celebrate this memorial, this memorial of Christ's humility and of his self-sacrifice, does my attitude reflect the humility and the self-sacrifice of Christ? Am I sitting here full of pride? Am I sitting here full of self-importance? Am I looking down on other people in the church, critical of what they've said or done, critical of decisions that have been made? Or does my attitude reflect the attitude of Christ? Do I have a servant spirit? That's a critical question, isn't it? And Jesus knew that when we asked those questions, we'd probably have to say no sometimes. So he gave us the foot washing service, didn't he? Because he had the same issue with his disciples. The church in Corinth wasn't unique. Jesus met there in the upper room with his 12 disciples. What were they doing? They were arguing about who was going to be the greatest. Pride and selfishness had taken root in their hearts. Pride and selfishness had taken root in their hearts. And Jesus knew that with that kind of attitude, they could not commune with him. They could not be one with him. They could not find fellowship with each other or with himself. And so what did he do? He humbled himself. He gave them an illustration. He took upon himself again the form of a servant. Washed their feet. And in doing so, symbolized the cleansing of their hearts that he wanted to perform. Washing away the pride and the selfishness. And you and I have that privilege this morning as we come, as we, before we come to the Lord's table, as we separate and have our feet washed. If we're honest with ourselves and with God, we will probably have to conclude there is at least a little bit of pride and a little bit of selfishness that's taken root in our hearts. And we need it to be washed away, don't we? We need the cleansing that only Christ can provide. Before we separate for the foot washing service, I'm just going to invite you to bow with me. I'd like to pray. Let's bow our heads together. Father in heaven, it's easy for us to look back at the church in Corinth just as we look back at Israel many, many years back further. And we say, how could they? How could they go so far off how could they get it so wrong? And at the same time, overlook the fact that our own hearts are perhaps not as pure as we would like to think they are. Father, we too cherish pride. We too cherish selfishness. We too cherish...
are tempted to look down on others and often do. We're tempted to elevate ourselves, to think of ourselves more highly than we ought to think. Father, we pray that you would be merciful to us this morning. That as our feet are washed, that you would do a work in our hearts, you would cleanse us from the defilement that sin brings. And fit us to commune with you and and fit us, Lord, to find fellowship, sweet fellowship with each other, that we might be united in Christ. Bless us to that end, please, as we separate now. In Jesus' name I ask it. Amen. Just a a couple of instructions. The ladies will be in the hall and the gentlemen in in the youth room, the seminar room around the back of the church. There will be a children's story here in the sanctuary um, for the children. If you are visiting with us today, um, and this is maybe your first time at, at, a, at an Adventist communion service, um, the foot washing may be new to you. And uh, in that case, you are welcome to, um, to watch if you just want to come and look and learn. We practice an open communion if you've committed your life to Christ Um, through baptism in any denomination, then then you're welcome to join with us. Um, But if you'd like to observe, you're welcome to do that. If you feel more comfortable just remaining seated here in the sanctuary, feel free to do that as well. And uh, once we've completed the foot washing service, we will return to uh, partake of the Lord's table. So let's, let's just separate now. Thank you.